welcome to the show. As we battle COVID-19 second wave of infections, tonight with us we have the FCCC CEO, Mr. Joel Abraham, to talk to us about compliance levels and also other measures that have been put in place to ensure that Fiji remains as COVID safe as possible. Good evening and welcome to the show, sir. Good evening. How are you? I'm um, good, thank you. And it's good to have you on the show. Before we start off, I'd like to congratulate you, of course, on a uh, shorter note that uh, FCCC, of course, has got 100% of its employees with the first jab. Yeah. What's it looking like for the future? Yes, uh, thank you, Geraldine. I mean, uh, when the uh, second wave of the pandemic was, uh, was announced, uh, the first thing we did was get to our human resources, found out how many uh, people had gone through and gotten their vaccination. The uptake uh, pre-second wave was uh, slightly less, but uh, as soon as the second wave hit, we knew our job was to be on the ground and the safety of our people were paramount. So what we did is people who had already gotten vaccinated, uh, we put them out on the ground first and we rotated until everybody was able to get the jab. And uh, as of today, we've got 100% of our people uh, that have taken their first jab and uh, we've got uh, about 50% that's uh, got in their second, so it's looking good. That's wonderful news. Looking forward though, we've seen that the number of daily COVID-19 cases has been escalating and of course, while there happens to be a midst of a global pandemic, there's always uh, the the most unscrupulous of business owners and of course customers that may yeah. be trying to exploit the situation as it is. Talk to us about so far, how's it been for the FCCC with compliance? Uh, thank you, Geraldine. So far, our team has been going on the ground. We've rolled out several programs. Uh, not just to do with the COVID-19 pandemic, but there are several other things that we need to look at when we are ensuring that consumers are protected and businesses do well and behave in an ethical manner. We've rolled out, uh, for businesses, we've rolled out a business assistance program, a supply chain disruption team that basically looks at and ensures that the supply chain is not affected. Where we find that supply chains have been affected, what we do is we try and get uh, in touch with the suppliers uh, some locally, some uh, overseas, and we try and find out when is the next shipment coming, whether shipments can be consolidated, and how soon can we ensure that uh, people have access to the goods that they want to buy. So it's across various uh, industries. Uh, one, we want supply security for the Fijian market. Apart from that, we've also rolled out a business assistance program, businesses that may have issues, say, to do with their banks, to do with their landlords, uh, to do with any other uh, government or regulatory agency, they can come to FCCC and we assist them. Uh, we do recognize that uh, at this point in time, businesses, especially SMEs, require assistance, and so we are there to provide that assistance. As far as our consumer protection is concerned, we've continued that. Uh, uh, we've got teams on the ground in all towns and cities, a ground enforcement team. We've most recently, uh, as of two weeks ago, opened up a temporary office in Nasori so that people from Nasori don't have to travel to Suva if they want to lodge their complaints or raise issues. So we've, uh, uh, j this is just below the uh, courthouse in Nasori, the Three Kings building. So we've got a temporary office there and this is in partnership with the commissioner, Commissioner's office, uh, making sure that we've got people on the ground so that when there's issues raised, we are able to respond immediately. And the team is not only working on a Monday to Friday schedule, they're working on a Sunday to Sunday schedule. So the teams out and about on the ground, as long as uh, shops are open, as long as people are moving around, we want the teams to be there to ensure that there's a high degree of compliance. Unfortunately, uh, there are some that do not uh, flow, follow the law. Some of it is blatant in nature, some of it is uh, uh, maybe erroneous, but uh, Either way, we found breaches and are quite concerned with it, but we have map, mapped out a strategy as to how we'll move forward. Can we uh, look into this in depth in the next segment? Stay with us after this. We'll look into the fact that the FCCC has been appointed as the enforcement agency under Section 82A of the Public Health Act, yeah. and we'll see how good or how well the uh, businesses, traders, and of course the public has been complying with this. Stay with us for more.
Welcome back. Mr. Abraham, we were talking about uh, the fact that the FCCC had been appointed as the enforcement agency mm -hmm. under Section 82A of the Public Health Act 1935. And this has to do with most of the infringements that may or breaches that may occur, especially sure. given the current COVID uh, pandemic right now. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, the government has said time and time again that uh, there is no lapse that can be allowed because of yeah. uh, public health and safety. With the regulations in place, with the FCCC being the uh, enforcement agency, what are the setbacks or the major challenges that you sure. usually come across? And what are some of the most uh, severe types of, uh, infri uh, shall we say, uh, breaches that you have come across? Uh, thank you, Geraldine. I mean, uh, FCCC uh, on 8th July 2021, under the Public Health Infectious Disease Infringement Notice Regulation of 2021, was appointed as the... Uh, enforcement agency. Now, this is simply recognizing that FCCC is already on the ground uh, enforcing consumer protection measures for businesses, ensuring that businesses do not engage in unethical practices. So, because the team is already on the ground, there are synergies that exist, and so it would not make sense to send another team just to check something extra. So, uh, what we did is we created a uh, task force, a team with Ministry of Health. Ministry of Commerce, uh, FCCC and the Fiji Police to try and ensure that there was compliance and uh, when this infectious disease infringement notice regulation came about, there were uh, fixed penalty offences and I'll, I'll, I'll read them out to you. So uh, you've got regulation 4 that's on curfew, you've got regulation 5 on containment and lockdown zones, you've got regulation 6 that's travel within containment zone, uh, regulation 7 on face covering. Regulation 8, face covering in business premises. Regulation 9 on contact tracing. Regulation 10 on gathering. Regulation 11 on contact sport engagement. Uh, regulation 12 on fiscal distancing in queues. Regulation 11 on inter-island passenger shipping and uh, travel flights. Uh, regulation 14 on uh, closure of businesses. Regulation 15 on closure of high-risk businesses. Regulation 16 on nightclubs. Regulation 17 on customer capacity, regulation 18 on passenger capacity. Now, these are the regulations that we found and uh, you'll understand that is why there's a mix of the Fiji police and the FCCC because some of these uh, things like containment zone or movements within containment zone or people who are walking out and about without wearing a face mask. So, those people, the police is more than uh, empowered to issue infringement notices. Now. What's happened is as soon as 20th April came about and uh, the regulations came up, the certain requirements of wearing masks, uh, yeah, requirements of uh, ensuring that uh, zones were declared as containment zones were already put in place. So because there was a lot more awareness already on this, what the police has done is started issuing infringement notices where they see breaches. Now unlike that, EFCCC was appointed on 8th July. Uh, and what we did is from 20th April to 8th uh, July uh, and from 8th July till 30th July, these two periods, what we've done is we've gone out and created a lot more awareness with businesses. One, we don't want businesses and people to be unnecessarily fined. We want people to follow the law. The intention of uh, putting infringement notices is not to collect money or collect uh, fines. The intention is that people must follow the law because following, not following the law it can be catastrophic, it's dangerous, it uh, helps spread the disease. As Dr. Fong says, when you move, the virus moves with you. And so, you must maintain all these COVID safety measures. So, what we've done is we've divided our enforcement into uh, two phases. Phase one has to do with uh, going out, doing inspection, uh, giving warnings, making sure that proper protocols are followed, uh, talking to businesses, uh, ground level up to director levels, having meetings with the associations, ensuring that everybody knows because the FCCC believes in a process of natural justice. We want everybody to be aware of what the law says. We want to uh, give them adequate notice and ability to be able to follow the law. So as, as we conclude phase one on 30th April, we've conducted 7,916 inspections, out of which we found 1,606 to be in breach. Now that's quite a high number. That, indicates a 20% non, non-compliant uh, uh, businesses. Unfortunately, uh, uh, for us, when we started this exercise, uh, we had our people go in uniforms. And when we were going in uniforms, we saw compliance levels sitting all the way up in, 90, in the 
We said, oh, compliance levels are high. But why is the, why is the virus spreading? Now, what we did is we ditched the uniforms. And now people just move around in civilian clothing. And when we did that, we found that compliance levels fell right away. Because what would happen is, while a business has allocated somebody to stand out there and take your temperature, or to uh, uh, check your KFEG app, what happens is there's laxity with the people that's actually doing it. So they don't check it. So the booth may be there. So when they see in uniform, they start checking it. But when they think you're a civilian, you can every four in ten people get missed out. So we found that compliance level fell, and there was a high degree of about 40 percent non-compliance. We were quite concerned. In the central division alone, and this is Suva Nasori corridor, we had 47 percent non-compliance. And that was quite high. And so we started having uh, all this discussion. And most recently, uh, on Thursday, we at 7 p.m., the Minister for Commerce, the PS uh, for Commerce, uh, and I, we uh, met with the Suva Retailers Association online and had a meeting with uh, all their members. And uh, just to raise more awareness and tell them not only about uh, the government initiatives that are in place to help businesses, but also to hammer in the fact that Compliance with COVID safety measures is important. It's essential. If we are going to emerge stronger as a nation uh, post this pandemic, we need to all work together. And ensuring that the safety measures are followed is everybody's duty. It's not the enforcement agency's duty. It's not the government's duty. It's everyone's duty to ensure that you follow COVID safety protocols. Because when you're doing it, when you're putting your mask on, you're doing it for your country. You're not doing it for anybody else. Pardon me for uh, interrupting, but looking at compliance levels, like you've said, of course, no one wants for their business to close down, not while we're in the midst of this. Mm -hmm. However, the businesses may be doing everything that they're supposed to do, but like you said, those that are tasked with ensuring that compliance levels remain high mm -hmm. may be lax. Yeah. But what about for customers and for traders that are not able or don't have the, the power or the authority to, to issue out infringement notices to them, but they see that uh, customers that are coming in are fragrant, fragrantly disregarding COVID protocols. What happens in those instances? So that, that's what we do, Geraldine. We ensure that our people, we've got a mechanism in place where if there is issues within, say, a particular supermarket, the manager of the particular supermarket will be able to contact the FCCC and will be able to deploy our people. So when we say we've got people in the Central Eastern Division, we've got more than about 50 people. So what they do is they've been given their clusters. So I give you an example. Say I live in Flagstaff, so I'm in the Flagstaff cluster. So irrespective of whether you're the CEO, the GM, or the manager, or the assistant monitoring officer, everybody's doing enforcement. So even I go out and do uh, enforcement in my, in my region. And what we do is we ensure that the people on the ground know who to contact. And so. Uh, with the degree of non-compliance, we found uh, instances where businesses have come and said, look, we do everything we can, but the customers are not following it. And we've been able to pick that out. I, I can give you an example. I was in New World uh, in, um, uh, near the market. Uh, and while I was in there, and I was counting, 18 out of 30 people were either not wearing their mask properly, so it was below the nose, or it was down here. Oh, it was one side was out. Uh, one didn't have a mask at all. So I, I stopped them. I said, look, you need to put your mask on and you need to do it properly. Putting it on just isn't uh, OK. Uh, then I stepped outside. I saw two gentlemen standing there uh, they're smoking. And I said, no, you shouldn't be. I said, you're smoking without your mask. I said, you're smoking. Your mask is not on. And the guy turns around to me and said, sorry, sir, I can't smoke with a mask on. I said, no, that's not what I meant. I meant don't smoke. Don't share cigarettes. Uh, because what you're not realizing is when you're doing that, you're actually contributing towards the spread of the virus. So uh, there seems to be some degree of laxity. And that's where I must thank the Fiji Police Force, uh, specifically um, the Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Siti Veningilio. Uh, he's brought about a certain degree of discipline within the force. And uh, the uh, police team is doing a phenomenal job. They're going out and they're doing the enforcement, making sure people comply. And uh, uh, 
looking at how they they are doing uh, uh, their enforcement uh, we have we have followed suit now of course because uh, some of the laws to do with businesses came about a bit later so what we've done is because our enforcement approach is more collaborative in nature we've given them the first warnings and uh, as of uh, first uh, august we've started issuing infringement notices as well the last I checked a few days ago, we had already issued six infringement notices. And uh, so we'll continue to do that. Let's put a pin in that, Mr. Abraham. Stay with us for more coming up after this break. Welcome back. Mr. Abraham, let's wrap up uh, COVID monitoring protocols, the, uh, sorry, monitoring of the COVID protocols that FCCC has been doing. Uh, you mentioned just as we left the last segment that the FCCC now has the power to uh, issue out infringement notices, not just to the traders, but also to customers that are coming in and that are disregarding the rules that are in place. Yeah, I mean, uh, at the end of the day, I think uh, the idea is to, is to achieve compliance. The last thing we want is to give anybody an infringement notice. We are cognizant of the business environment that exists today. We uh, also understand that the COVID pandemic has also affected people's livelihood and their income streams as well. And as such, we don't want to go around just, you know, giving anybody fine. That's not the idea. And that is why we continue to advocate on this and say, look, please follow the law. You know, put your mask on properly, maintain your distance, ensure that you have your app on. If you don't, make sure you sign in your details. So. Unfortunately, it's just that the uh, in Fiji, I mean, you've got this culture, you know, mm -hmm. where when you get the tsunami warning and uh, usually it, you say, you know, move to a higher ground, we've got some people that will run to the seawall to see the tsunami coming, you know. And uh, it's, it's unfortunate. Or when you have got uh, flooding in low-lying areas, instead of staying indoors and keeping safe, you'll find, you'll see children jumping off the bridge into flooded waters. Uh, I mean, there's a huge, uh, it's, a, it's a huge cultural problem in Fiji. Uh, compliance or, or trying, uh, following the law is, uh, or following rules is, is difficult. And as such, uh, enforcing uh, some of these things can become very, uh, can become very difficult. And uh, unfortunately, the fine, uh, the infringement notices are there to deter people. And uh, and that's 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 it. Um, it's interesting that you uh, that you make note of herd mentality. Of yeah. course, with that uh, being the case, there's always those that are looking for either a scapegoat to put mm -hmm. up and say, "Oh, but this person did it, and they didn't get an infringement notice. Yeah. So why are you charging me?" Mm -hmm. Could you clarify for the public, though? Are there any lapses that are that are allowed, or is that a s on the spot? If you were uh, caught breaching it, then you get an infringement notice. So, so it's, on, it's on the spot, there's, uh, there's no lapses allowed because some of these are very uh, clear-cut offenses. I mean, if you're, if you're not wearing the mask, you're not wearing it. There's no, not much in, uh, investigation to do there. As opposed to, say, it, if it was, say, a price gouging thing, you know, you, prima facie, you may say this is price gouging, the prices have increased, but as per the law, there's several things that you need to investigate before you can uh, charge somebody. Most of the issues uh, that's given there are, say, curfew, regulation 2, right? So if you're violating it, uh, it's, it's clear cut, you know? And so all of these offenses that are there, it's really uh, to do with uh, giving infringement notices on the spot. When you say about curfew, uh, just reminded me about some traders that try to uh, go around the bend saying that the curfew is at 6 p.m. every day, but because I have too many customers inside the shop and, you know, they may be still finishing up their shopping, so thereby, you know, I may close at 7 o'clock. Do yeah. they get an infringement notice yeah, as well? Yes, they do, because see, at the end of the day, businesses need to be aware that the uh, curfew, I mean, everybody is aware curfew time is at 6 p.m. If you know coffee town is 6, 6 p.m., please ensure that you close well in advance so that you are able to do whatever restocking, cleaning, whatever you need to do, disinfecting that you need to do inside. Get your employees to be able to knock off and reach home before the curfew. And so when we started this, we found this to be an issue, but that's, that has been resolved. Some people claim they did not. Uh, they did not understand it. We said ignorance of the law is not a defense. But nonetheless, we ensured that we uh, were able to explain the requirements of the law. Again, uh, the meeting that we had with the super retailers on Thursday, we've said, look, if any of you don't understand what's in here, 
please ask us, we will send a team to come in and explain, we will do uh, uh, an awareness session with you. Uh, and uh, mostly the traders said, look, we can't do this during the day because we are, uh, I mean, we are doing business. We said, we will do it at night. Whatever time you want, we will come and do it. So at the end of the day, we are interested in making sure everybody follows the law. And that's that's all there is uh, there's to it. Now, now that you have said that uh, you, you can't uh, feign ignorance of the law, but mm. this is a long, this is something that is a long standing issue. Of course, prior to COVID, there were people who were still uh, indulging in price gouging, in false advertising, yep. in non deliverance of uh, goods and services that were promised or that had been purchased or paid for. This is something that they cannot say that I didn't know about it. Exactly. Uh, objectively, looking at the uh, COVID period and pre COVID period, what are the stats looking like? Is there uh, more compliance after all of the um, adv uh, advocacy that's been done by FCCC and other uh, stakeholders as well, or is it stagnant at the same place? So uh, pre-COVID, the compliance levels were all right. Uh, as soon as the second wave hit and the lockdown restrictions hit, compliance levels went up because the number of businesses operating had reduced. So instead of having a thousand shops, you only had say about 10 that were open. And if the 10 were compliant, then you probably would have had 100% compliant. Uh, and so what we found is the compliance levels uh, shot up not because people were complying, it's because the number of businesses that were operating were small. So it was an outlier in the data set, so we, we excluded that. We found compliance levels generally within businesses to be, to be okay. That being said, uh, there's always a few bad apples, you know. Not all businesses are bad. There's some very good ethical compliant businesses and they're doing quite well. And we encourage them and we congratulate them when they do well. There's some that uh, willfully disobey. So they know it's wrong, it's just a matter of when, when we will catch up to them. So uh, that's that cluster. Then there's other, there's another category where you have got the director sitting on top they want to comply, but the people that's on the ground, they don't do their work, so there is a disconnect. And wherever we find there is a breach, we've got different uh, three-prone approach to deal with different scenarios. Uh, we have been investigating, and I've seen comments, uh, people have asked me, look, you know, what's the FCCC doing? The prices of things are high, businesses are behaving unethically, supermarkets are increasing prices, they're selling bad potatoes, bad onions. So in the last so many months, we've taken about, uh, we've charged about 106 diff uh, traders. Now we don't go and publicize it and say, look, oh, by the way, we've charged so many people because again, non-compliance is nothing to be proud of. In fact, it, uh, it, it's very discouraging sometimes to see that uh, when people are suffering, there are certain businesses, there are certain unethical elements that will try and profiteer of the vulnerability of some Fijians. Now this was the case in say areas that were say uh, just outside the lockdown. Sawani was one one good example. Traders there thought no, the F Triple C cannot come, they cannot move. So what they would do is they would move their price up and down, up and down. And so uh, we did make visits. Uh, we found quite a few of them to be uh, non-compliant, and they were subsequently charged. And the matter has now been taken to court. Ten specifically were to do with price gouging. The 21 price gouging investigations that we were doing. Apart from that, what we've noticed is the number of consumer complaints pre and post COVID has increased. Uh, pre COVID levels, post COVID levels, uh, post COVID is about four to five times more than pre COVID levels. One, because we think there has been a paradigm shift where people are more aware and uh, more worried about uh, getting value for money, what they spend, where they spend, and if they are getting value for money. Uh, with the increase of e-commerce uh, trading platforms, we received quite a lot of complaints to, uh, to do with refunds and, uh, and rebates. So you may order, say, you may sit at home online, look at something over social media and order, say, a medium, right, or a size 10 uh, top. But when it comes, uh, it may have size 10 on it, but it doesn't fit you. <laughs> so you got, you want to return it. And then... Uh, because it's an, uh, it trades over an electronic platform, it's not a shop itself, you're not sure which size you're going to get next. So what you do is you say, I want a refund. And the other party that was selling says, hang on, there's no refund. Hmm. So th those were a lot of, uh, those are high uh, number of complaints with the e-commerce uh, space as well. 
the complaints do increase, uh, we do try and sort that. Uh, I receive complaint on a daily basis. We open different uh, platforms to receive complaints. So, we receive complaints on a daily basis. Just today I have received two complaints. If we could pick that up in the next segment, sure. stay with us. We'll be back after the break. Welcome back. Uh, Mr. Abraham, we were talking about how businesses sometimes do tend to uh, take the initiative to be as compliant as possible. However, there's always, like you mentioned, a few bad apples. Mm. Now, let's look at the uh, concerns of the members of the public. I think the last time that you had come up, you had explained why there are certain things that the FCCC is able to regulate the prices on sure. and certain things that they're not able to. However, given that we're months into the second wave, there are Fijians who are still struggling to get uh, COVID with essentials, which includes your proper face masks and also sanitizers, uh, cleaning agents and all of that. And we notice that there's a discrepancy with the prices of the same product mm. with different traders. Sure. Can you clarify on that? Yeah. So there are certain things that we reg directly regulate, which are called price control items. So uh, uh, if you look at things like face masks, hand gloves, face shields, these are none of these are price controlled, right? Uh, simply because when a new market opens up, there are uh, competitive pressures that will push the prices down and bring it to equilibrium levels. You find that when uh, the second wave started, uh, uh, a blue surgical mask was costing somewhere between a dollar, a uh, dollar to a dollar fifty. Uh, it went as high as about two dollars, I think, somewhere in Nindi. Uh, now that same mask you can get for much, much, much cheaper. Uh, probably 10, 20 times cheaper. Uh, in the market, we've seen anywhere between 50 cents. Uh, the lowest we saw was about 28 cents per mask. So, competi uh, competition puts a downward pressure on price. There's a lot more people emerge in the market and they start providing uh, the service and market forces bring the prices down. Now, that is a function of, a, of how the market actually works. What we do is we our intervention is basically to view the market and see where somebody is non-compliant. Uh, when I say non-compliant, somebody may be engaging in price gouging. So say that particular mask costs about 20 cents to get into Fiji, but somebody is trying to sell it for $2 because they have seen an upward shift in price. Now, these were the traders that were being investigated and some of them have been charged already. So. Uh, we continue to do that and once we go uh, hard with the enforcement action on, on these few bad apples, we find that there is a huge downward pressure on prices, so the prices start coming down. Uh, uh, as far as uh, supply stock is concerned, we have uh, been monitoring, you can fi find disposable face masks in uh, almost uh, majority of or all the pharmacies, majority of the shops, I think everybody is even, I have seen some roadside vendors selling masks. So, uh, uh, there is quite a lot happening in that space and what is happening is the uh, market is now able to regulate itself. So, uh, 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 we do not see a need for an intervention to just control the price. But that is just on face masks. Yep. Uh, for other essential items, uh, say for example, or what we consider essential at this point yep. in time, like your sanitizers or antibacterial wipes or stuff like that, what about those? Yeah, so when you look at, uh, so what we've been doing is we've been doing surveys on these products to make sure that the prices are not artificially inflated, that it is a function of the market. Now, yes, globally there's a demand for this product, so you'll see a increase in the price because high demand puts an upward pressure on price. So you will see prices increasing. What we do is we've got access into the FRCS SCUDA system. We go and see how many are importing it, how many are importing raw materials, who's making it, and what is the average price at which people are selling, and whether that average price is artificially driven. Now, if the price is not artificially driven, then there is no need for an intervention. So, what we found is uh, there were isolated incidents where people were trying to make a lot of money, and these people were investigated and charged. However, if you look at the prices now in the market, I think uh, they are a function of the market. So. 
Looking at the market, as you said, uh, FCCC has, despite the second wave of COVID, continued on with its ground inspections. Yeah. So looking at the major infringements and those uh, breaches, uh, whether COVID-related or non-COVID-related, what sure. were the major ones that popped up? So the major ones, of course, was uh, overcharging, uh, failing to mark the prices, uh, was failure to issue receipts, uh, uh, failure to keep and uh, provide records. So. We found that uh, the second one, especially price marking, was an issue because if you don't mark the price, right, say, say this particular pen, you go and buy this, if there's no price written on it or there's no price displayed for it, what happens is you don't know what price you're supposed to be buying at. So I can tell you, you got to pay $5 for this. Now, say you really need this pen, you probably will pay $5 for it. And so, that is why price marking becomes very important and we've been impressing this on traders. You need to mark and display prices and it's important that when uh, consumers, they go out shopping, they also see that they, they are buying products and the products have price markings on them or price displays because that allows you as a consumer to compare which one to buy and uh, by not putting prices, you are basically depriving consumer of their choices. We found uh, overcharging to be an issue. The items which are price controlled, businesses were charging more than they were supposed to. They were identified and uh, subsequently charged. Stay with us for more after this break. Welcome back. Mr. Abraham, this is our final segment. And before we move on to landlord and tenancy issues, which I'm sure a lot have come up and complaints have been raised, let's uh, just quickly cover some of the common issues that have come up during ground sure. inspections. And uh, as, I can, as I can see, the FCCC has noted that there's been breaches for protocols number 10, 12, and 25. Yep. For those that are not familiar with them, please talk to us about it. Yeah, sure. Uh, in, in fact, there's five protocols that we found to be the most commonly breached. One, uh, sorry, protocol number six is uh, temperature monitoring for employees and customers. So if somebody's temperature is 37 point and above, uh, they may have COVID-like symptoms and they, it must be documented and communicated to the Ministry of Health and Medical Services. Protocol number seven is to have QR codes printed and di displayed at the entry and exit location of businesses. Now, while a lot of businesses may have them, the problem now is that there is no enforcement of it. So what they do is you could have uh, the protocols there, somebody is standing here, uh, look, making sure, they're supposed to be making sure that everybody's scanning it, but they're not doing it. Uh, we did an inspection in Nasori about uh, a week ago and I was moving around with the team. We went into the shop, we came out, nobody. We went back in, two other people came in. So we asked, we called the owner, we said, you know what's happening? He said, he said who's supposed to be looking after this? He said, oh, I'm supposed to be look uh, looking after them. He's seated in his office at the back <laughs> and he said, do you know nobody's checking that, nobody's scanning. There is no sign to say you must scan. And so what he had done is placed them right under the, where the shelf were. Uh, nobody's going to bend down there to do it. Half of the people didn't even see it. Mm. We were looking for it, so we found it. Uh, <laughs> and, and that's the difficulty. Uh, protocol number 10, having a dedicated isolation room or section to isolate suspected COVID cases. So the requirement for businesses is you must have an isolation room somewhere, right? This room must be dedicated simply because, say, somebody comes in under protocol number six, has a high temperature, has, say, about 38 or 39, is coughing, uh, has all the COVID-like symptoms. You're supposed to then get this person isolated while you con uh, contact the Ministry of Health. So the businesses uh, where they did not have the, uh, these isolation rooms or facilities put in, that was problematic. Uh, although they all communicated and told that before you open up, these are the requirements. They all say yes. But when we go, it, it is basically not there. Uh, protocol 12 is uh, instruction to disallow entry onto the premises if people don't have the KFG up or don't want to sign the register. Right? 
uh, there is a requirement that you must have the KFEG app, right? If you have a smartphone, now there are people who do not have the smartphones, right? The button phones. If you do not have it, uh, there is a register where you have to put in your details. There are people who refuse to sign in their details saying, I do not want to. In those instances, uh, the people who are refusing to show the app, right? So, if you are refused uh, entry, it is because you are refusing to share your details and the reason these details are being sought is for contact tracing purposes. Uh, then this protocol number 25 where the business shall provide company transport to all employees from home to business uh, and uh, private transportation can also be used but with strict protocols. Now, the idea here was to keep the employees in a bubble right? so that they do not go around and uh, get exposed and if they are exposed then there are so many customers coming in through the doors of businesses. So, say if you are a supermarket right, and uh, your somebody gets infected there, they could be, that could be a super spreader. So, uh, the idea is to ensure that employee, employers take all reasonable steps to keep the employees in a bubble. Just to clarify, uh, with protocol number 25 where it says that if the business uh, is going to be providing uh, company transport back yeah. and forth uh, from the uh, site, business site, uh, if those who happen to have their own transportation, that is personal. Now, for people who do not have their own mode of transportation and the business is not picking and dropping them, they are not supposed to be using public transportation to get yeah. to work. That is an infringement there. Yes. Okay. Looking at another thing, of course, uh, you have noted that this is something that's been ongoing for a long, long time. With COVID right now, there's yeah. people who are on both sides of the fence trying to exploit the system, which is sure. uh, either as a tenant or either as a landlord. Yeah. And given that uh, legal avenues may be difficult to access uh, and that certain services may not be available to them, what are the solutions that are available to them? And have you noted that the number of uh, landlord and tenant complaints or rent complaints or anything of that nature has increased? Sure. I mean, uh, just from the period April, uh, to now, uh, we are looking at the statistics and I was reading, uh, looking at the report for this year. We have got 812 uh, rent cases, uh, that is high and these are formal cases that are formally documented as complaints. We also get informal complaints, meaning somebody will say, I am facing these issues, what do I do? Uh, I want some assistance, but I do not want to give my name. Um, uh, I just wanted to report this matter, I have seen this happening. Can you a act on it? So, apart from this 812, uh, the number of informal, informal complaints is about more than a thousand. So, uh, there is a high degree of complaints coming in, uh, both formal and informal in the uh, rental space. So, you still have got issues with uh, landlords trying to increase the rent, right? You still have got issues, no agreement, no receipts. You've got uh, issues now. We've got some landlords giving complaints to say, "Look, my tenant is a tenant is working. The husband and wife are both working. They don't want to pay rent, mm -hmm. right?" So there's a degree of truancy. We have maintained our stance that the contract between a landlord and tenant is a private contract, and if you are a tenant, you must take all reasonable steps to make arrangements with your landlord. Mm -hmm. Now. That being said, we do receive cases, we try and mediate and resolve it on a case by case be uh, basis because uh, different uh, issues raise different complaints have different sets of facts. Mm -hmm. And so, we try and look at the facts surrounding a particular case and uh, get uh, both parties to uh, uh, some sort of resolution. Well, we're just coming to the end of the show. So, before we wrap this up, since you mentioned that, uh, since there's a high degree of uh, cases that have been coming up, for restitution that may be available to uh, those that are aggrieved, what is it that they can do? Is Do they have to go and contact uh, other agencies or is the FCCC the one that is tasked with enforcement of the uh, landlord and tenants uh, agreement? So, uh, what we do, Geraldine, we do not believe in making people uh, run around. So, if somebody is coming with a complaint that probably got to do with another organization, what we try and do is we give the person an uh, option. Do you, do you feel comfortable going yourself or do you want us to do this on your behalf? Uh, do you want us to flag this complaint to this particular other agency so you can get some assistance? We usually refer matters to say the Human Rights and Anti-Discrimination Commission, we refer matters to the Legal Aid Commission as well. So, the instances where we do ask uh, uh, these uh, complainants whether they want to, 
and if it is a matter of uh, pertaining to them, uh, if there is no uh, breach of the F triple C F per se, then we ensure that those matters are referred. Uh, the idea is to work together and the idea is to uh, ease the burden of people who are already uh, in a very vulnerable situation that is coming to lodge a complaint. We recognize that people come to us to lodge a complaint because they are in, in a state of vulnerability. And so, we do not want to uh, make them run around more. Now, that being said, we do face a lot of enforcement challenges. We have got uh, requirements where we need to still follow the law. The process of natural justice still exists. So, just because somebody is lodging a complaint does not mean it will happen tomorrow. What that means is we need to go in and ensure that we investigate it thoroughly before we can come to some sort of an outcome. Now, at this point in time, the people who we are trying to investigate, they come up with things like, uh, I am not vaccinated or uh, can you give me proof that your people who are going to investigate this are vaccinated. Uh, I won't come in for a question interview because I am not feeling safe. Uh, I'm, I don't know where you guys have been, so I don't want to come in. Uh, and there's, there's quite a lot of issues that come. Now, we have managed to find ways around it. We have also uh, sought assistance from the Fiji Police Force. We've uh, 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 sought assistance from the ground teams to go and visit uh, this particular uh, premises to see, to do inspections. So, we've all been also doing ground inspections. Uh, and where we find the cases uh, that require uh, taking the next step, then of course, the people are question interviewed and then uh, subsequently charged. Thank you very much for your time uh, today and we wish you and your team all the best and of course, Thank safe you. health as well. Thank you. Thank you for joining us tonight. We hope that you tune in again next week and until then, stay safe.